I'm John Bowman, and I'm a freelance writer and editor, and now semi-retired. And what's your connection to the poem, The Face on the Barroom Floor? Well, I have to start by saying it came about when Henry Malacone, the composer with whom I had uh, collaborated uh, on a previous short opera, contacted me in 1977, and he said he had a commission from the Central City Opera Company, uh, and it was to do an opera uh, that must be based on something uh, with Colorado history, and preferably even uh, around the mining days of Central City. And it so happened I had a, an old army buddy with whom I had been involved in opera productions, who I knew had actually once interned at Central City Opera, and came from Colorado, and I quickly contacted him, and he sent me some information, which included uh, this picture of a portrait on the floor of the Teller House, a bar in Central City. And it told the story and claimed that it was the face on the barroom floor uh, based on a poem. And so that sent me at once to look up the poem. And perhaps getting ahead here, I would soon learn that the face on the barroom floor in the Teller House came in 1936, uh, did not inspire the poem. The poem had been published in, 1980, in 1887. But that was my first introduction. If I had heard of the poem as a young man, I do not recall that. Oh, so, <clears throat> tell me about the poem. The poem was written by this somewhat mysterious man, Hugh Antoine Darcy, that's D apostrophe, the French Darcy, who was evidently, I've since discovered, uh, his father was French, his mother was English, he was brought up for a while in England, and then they emigrated to the United States. In any case, he seems to have totally mastered not only the American language, but something of American feel for the American you know, culture. And uh, he was a sort of a balladeer poet of the time, uh, late 19th century. Young man, when he wrote this, he would have been, come to think he was born in 1843. What? Well, he was 44 years old. And he published this. And it had immediate success. By the way, it was then titled The Face on the Floor, not The Barroom Floor. That got uh, added because it takes place from almost the first words of the poem. It's in a barroom. And uh, he went on and married the daughter of a early Hollywood uh, producer whose name for the moment escapes me, and then had a minor career in Hollywood in writing scripts and uh, in the production and through his wife's connection, died in 1925. And although he published at least one volume of these popular ballad poems, uh, he has no reputation for anything except this one poem. I would just like to add, by the way, that he, it's, it's of the same genre as a still better known poem, uh, Casey at the Bat, which was published in, 19, in 1888, exactly one year later. It's just interesting that these two uh, American gems were published within such a uh, close time period. You, you, you told me that you're a, you're a historian and a writer. Yes. And so I would imagine you have some thoughts about what was poetry like, what was American poetry like in, in the 1880s? What, where did it stand in terms of popular culture? Well, it, I had not expected to give my attention to that, but if we think about it, it was at a time of uh, Longfellow, James Russell Lowell, uh, those are the two uh, best-known poets, and they certainly were writing similar, you know, The Ride of Paul Revere, Hiawatha, they were the same type of ballad poems, and everybody would recite them. So this false, uh, within the genre of these uh, poems in which were given public recitals of a somewhat later generation, and I've since learned he was inspired by uh, The Face on the Floor, is Robert Service, the uh, Yukon uh, poems, uh, which are also a great popularity. Uh, to this day, people still you know, recite them with great vigor. And uh, 
so it, it falls within that genre. A poetry was still uh, the the distinction we would make today between uh, high level uh, intellectual verse poetry and popular verse had, had not yet uh, come into being. Robert Browning, for instance, in England, his poems, many of them so-called dramatic monologues, people could recite them and they were known through a wide spectrum of, of the public, not just by intellectuals. I mean, who reads New Yorker poems today uh, except a few people who struggle with them in the New Yorker, but you don't hear anybody reciting them. Uh, I can't uh, think, uh, it's it's uh, rock musicians and oh, today who write the lyrics that people uh, sing, uh, not poems. I, I can't think immediately of well, too many actually, poems. Well, actually, poetry now is, is, is mostly in the African-American culture. Yes. It's, it's, it's called slamming. And right. And that's where there's poem with, poems without That's music. right. That's right. Poetry slams, I, which I don't happen to attend. <laughs> But you're quite right. That's why I didn't think of them. You're right. They come close to this. So there is still this uh, tradition of uh, reciting poetry. I, I, I'm old enough to remember having to, on occasion, maybe, maybe, maybe not even I, but people who I knew who, who had to memorize poems in yes. school. Yes. And, and, and I presume this was a form of education. This yeah, was that's a way right. Of, 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 I did too. My children didn't. I do not recall my children coming home and having to learn, you know, Midnight Ride of Paul Revere or Hiawatha or any of those poems, but we did, my generation. Do you remember any of them? Uh, opening lines. Like what? <laughs> Listen, my children, and you shall hear the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. That's about as far as I go. Any others? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not good at that. I once, uh, when I was in probably junior high, entered uh, you know the annual elocution or contest and recited uh, Casey at the Bat, but I've even forgotten that. <laughs> Let's go back now. So, talk to me about the, the 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 creative process that you did with Henry in terms of creating the, the opera. Yes. Well, uh, again, I should say Henry's original. Uh, uh, re uh, request was he was, thought he was going to get a, a full three-act opera, and uh, it, uh, it was I was going to base it uh, loosely inspired, you may say, by this poem, and I wrote uh, the plot outline for a three-act opera, and uh, I had barely sent it to him, and he said, "I'm sorry, John. Now they're telling me that it can only be a short one-act opera." So I had to completely set aside that elaborate plot and come up. Uh, with a, a short uh, uh, plot, and it bears only loose resemblance to the uh, the original poem, the poem uh, "The Face on the Floor." And uh, a second uh, element here is that by the time we were told this, uh, I'm going to say it was let's say October, November of '77, and they wanted to premiere it in uh, July 1978. So we were under some uh, pressure to do this very quickly. And uh, I am a pretty fast worker. Uh, maybe I should uh, uh, blot a few more lines, but I had to get this to Henry, and uh, he liked my uh, libretto and uh, said he'd start to work on it at once. And by now we were certainly into January of uh, 1978, and uh, Henry was had to really produce it. And for the most part, he stayed with my uh, words. Again, perhaps if he had had more time, he would have sent more back to me, but he pretty much set my words. And like any composer, he could get to repeat lines and return to lines. I mean, that's what a composer does. And in one instance, he said, John, I'm going to ask you to do this. I have a melody uh, 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 that I've written, and uh, I would... I." want to use it, and I want the uh, young woman to sing this melody at a certain place, and I'm going to ask you in this instance to write words for that melody. Well, I'm not a trained musician, but I was an old choir boy, and I still could carry a tune in those days, and he sent me a tape of the melody, and I can still remember I played the tape, and I would walk around Northampton, where I lived, Northampton, Mass., and I'd 
keep the tune until I got it in my mind. And since I knew the plot, the point in the plot, and what this young woman uh, would be singing at about that point, I actually composed the words uh, to fit that music. But that was the only instance. I've since discovered that most people I run into assume that it works the other way. They assume that uh, since the music is really the most important element in an opera, that the composer writes the music and sends it to a librettist to set words to. But in fact, it, it tends to work the other way. Especially with Shakespeare. Yes, right. <laughs> Give me a reasoning behind the, the, the story. I mean, how did the story come to you? Here you are, play, you're faced with this da 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 yes. da 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 Right. And you have to write an opera which is a little less prosaic. And you want yes. To, what, what gave you the idea? First of all, did you go to the... Te did you go to, to Central City Opera? Did you go to the Taylor House? No, no, I'd never been there. Okay. No, but my friend, this army buddy who had time, he had a lot of materials since he had grown up in, in uh, Denver and uh, spent time at Central City. He sent me a package of materials, brochures and things. So I had an image, uh, clear uh, pictures of the place, and of course the painting on the floor. And uh, I read the poem and uh, I'm I'm a really can't claim to know exactly. At one point, I had, if you will, I, 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 uh, the inspiration to uh, write the libretto the way I did, to write structure it all. It's in the poem. I sh guess I should say uh, this derelict vagabond uh, comes staggering into Joe's bar and uh, can't afford a drink, and he asks if the, some of the patrons in this bar, by the way, it's, it's, since it's uh, uh, 1887, uh, uh, we can set it in a time, but it's not specifically a Western bar, it's a bar. And he asks for a drink, he says he has no money, and um, they, uh, other patrons at the bar uh, are kind of sort of throw the bum out, uh, so to speak, and uh, he says, all right, I'll, I'll paint uh, a portrait of the woman I loved, and I'll tell you the story. And uh, uh, I was a painter, believe it or not, I was once a prosperous painter, and uh, I fell in love with this young woman, and uh, she fell in love uh, with another man, and he uh, swept her away, and ever since then I was so devastated, I fell apart, and now I'm down on my luck. And, uh, but I'll paint her portrait on the floor if you'll buy me a drink. And he paints the portrait, and then the last line, with a shriek, he falls dead. That, that's the way the poem goes. Something about that, I didn't want to write an opera quite on that, and I got this idea uh, of setting it first in the framework of a modern a couple that walks into the bar, and the, their story, and then they get a, like a flashback to a man who paints the portrait on the floor and then we come back to the present and I really can't say exactly any longer when I got that notion but it, can, it must have come to me pretty quick because I didn't have too much time to uh, to you know kick it around it's kind of cinematic I mean, uh -huh. there many movies are just like that. yes and, and uh, actually, what we're trying—I'm trying to think of what I want to do mm -hmm. since I have—I have this whole little playpen to play mm -hmm. in because I have—they're uh, giving me a lot of time with mm -hmm. the, the performers. And I was thinking of filming the modern part mm -hmm. in the theater mm -hmm. and the other part in the teller in the teller bar, oh, so yes. there'd be two different settings. Right. To see, because we were filming, yes. we could even have two different costumes. We don't have to. Yes, you could do set. that. Um, I don't know how Henry feels about that, because right. I haven't told him yet. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. but that could be kind of exciting. Right. You know, the premiere, and for the first few years, the production uh, was done in the Teller House right. bar with the actual uh, portrait on the floor. And it was the stage director, I think it was Robert Darling. I don't know whether he, uh, he's still, uh, it was one of the people you'll be uh, interviewing. Uh, he, I thought, had the brilliant idea uh, since uh, the portrait had to be painted, he put a light sand over the portrait, and as the painter used his brush uh, on the floor, he was revealing the painting. Well, after doing this a few times, 
the bar owners said, you know, this is getting to be too popular. We thought, you know, if you're going to do it a couple times, but here it is now the third year and you're still brushing sand over the portrait, that won't go. So they moved it across the street, as I understand it, into uh, what they call the stables and set up a, a stage setting bar. Uh, but the portrait is on the floor and that was painted in 1936, it turns out, it has little or nothing to do. Maybe the painter, uh, I, I'm willing to believe the painter knew of the poem. It was probably still popular, but he was he was if inspired by the paint uh, by the poem, not vice versa. Do you know how that occurred? The actual painting occurred. There are different stories. Oh, one is that he had some kind of a, a falling out with uh, some other person involved with the Teller House, and uh, and that person left, and almost uh, not in spite, but sort of as a parting shot. He is alleged to have left this, like uh, his calling card, on the floor. Uh, Some punishment. Yes, right. <laughs> and of I'll course, make this a landmark. Yes, forever. right. right. <laughs> That'll teach him. Yes, <laughs> right. And then his name is Herndon Davis, H E R N D O N, and uh, you can look him up. He had a, a slight uh, reputation as an illustrator artist, and went on, as I understand, to be uh, a painting at the Smithsonian Institution as part of their exhibits, you know, when they needed uh, murals or, or Western paintings, especially Western scenes. He's one of the, in this genre of Western painting. Had a, 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 as I say, a small reputation. It's interesting, isn't it, that, that the poem was, was in honor of Central City and yes. their environs, and of course, yes. the, last, the last thing that was, the last opera that was done on the same basis was the Ballad of Baby Doe. Yes, that's right. Which is also which is on my label, which right? Right. So uh -huh. that's right. Thinking. It's inspired uh, 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 several operas, and uh, uh, and then there was the musical, Sinkable Molly Brown. Right. right. Another one came out of that era of the uh, Colorado mining days, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the structure. Talk about the structure of the. Give me a description of the structure of the opera. Give me a, a synopsis of the right. opera. I think I've always, uh, just before I start, I, you asked me how I came about it, I can't remember, but uh, I've written other things and I'm always interested in the interplay between art and life, if I can put it not too pretentiously. And so I got this notion of a young couple at the Central City Opera Festival who uh, come into the bar uh, having seen a performance, I think that's clear from the brief uh, uh, dialogue as they enter, and uh, the girl takes one look at the bartender, and this has to be staged cleverly, and he, it's clear that they make contact, and she now wants to leave the bar. Uh, nothing is said, but it has to be staged so that you understand that. And uh, the, her boyfriend sees the portrait, and uh, start sort of uh, somewhat teasing and joshing the bartender about the, uh, this portrait on the floor. And the bartender says, well, I'll tell you the story since you insist. And then we move into the flashback and we learn the story of uh, the young woman, Madeline, and these two uh, men who are in love with her and uh, they get into eventually a struggle over her and there's a gun and she gets between them to try to separate them and a shot is fired and she falls dead. And that ends the, the middle part and then we return to the present and uh, the bartender at this point puts a pistol on the bar and says, uh, here's the actual pistol and the boyfriend, uh, of course, being is skeptical of the whole story and uh, doesn't realize to, yet that there's anything here between his girl and the bartender. And they start again uh, a, a kind of an argument and the gun somehow gets in the hand and these two men struggle and she puts herself between them and she's shot. So it replicates the uh, the the old story. 
<laughs> Rod certainly couldn't have done it better. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm starting to wonder if, if, if the Teller Bar is an actual active bar. I mean, that's yes, it, it is. Oh, yes. See, I, now what I'm starting to think I want to do is when I get there, I'm going to get there about two weeks before mm -hmm. the performances. I want to film oh, the rehearsals yes. and all that. But I would love to, on an unsuspecting group of people it, at the Teller Bar, is to do the first scene it, with people there and, and, and not tell them. Uh -huh. So this couple will walk in and they'll just start... Uh -huh. Talking to the bartender and start saying. No, where you're going to have this. Uh, uh, Henry scored it for only three uh, instruments. So Absolutely. So we could have these people hidden in the bar. Yes, right. I don't think it's a bad idea. You know, you, you, I don't know, right. you know about flash mobs, the idea of, of yes. performing something in a public right. place where nobody knows. Right. That would be kind it's of It's a large, uh, long, oaken, old fashioned 19th century mm. bar, uh, relatively wide. In other words, there's the bar. There's the floor, and then there's some tables. So it's not like a narrow bar, but it's not it's not a great big square room. It's a definitely a longish room, a rectangular room. But there, there people sit at these tables, and the portrait is now protected by a tiny little uh, uh, fence-like structure, so, so that people no don't step line, on it. Right. No but line. yes, it's an right. active bar, That's at least great. during the summer. That could be uh -huh. fun. Tell me about the reactions. Okay, tell me about the opening. I, you, you were not there at the opening. Yes, I was there for the opening. Talk to me about the uh, opening night. And well, talk, talk, talk to me, and I won't interrupt you, but talk to me about the the premiere, leading yes. up to the premiere. Right. Tell me everything. It was, as I say, it had to be composed by Henry with with uh, under some pressure, and he made it, and he went out to Central City, of course, before I did, and Robert Darling, the then head of the Central City Opera, uh, personally staged it, as I recall. And I arrived, uh, I flew out to Denver on my own and was met and driven up to Central City. And uh, I do remember the uh, final dress rehearsal. And the this is what uh, I do remember. The, they were doing another opera in the main, there's another opera house there, a smallish opera house, a real uh, opera house. And they signed up uh, then, as I believe they do now, youngish singers, but many of them are with the Met in, in the City Center Opera and other opera companies, quite experienced singers. And I do not remember the opera they were doing, to be honest. And they came to the dress rehearsal. And uh, what I remember is that they just cheered clapped and we thought wow maybe we have a winner on our hands because these were seasoned opera singers and they just seemed to be delighted by it and it it took off uh, from that point on everybody who saw it just seemed to enjoy it and um, we we uh, must have done about six or eight performances that first summer and it had enough success so they can continued to do it every summer until uh, to summer 2011, for whatever reason, they discontinued it. I have one story, if I may, uh, you can edit this out. Uh, I stayed around for another couple days, and they had put out a poster to uh, for the production, and then they have a store, as so many places do, attached to the opera house where they sold programs, uh, posters and calendars and memorabilia and whatnot, souvenirs for the whole uh, experience. And uh, Henry and I were uh, in there when uh, a woman walked in and saw the poster. She had seen the opera the night before, or the day before, and she wanted to po buy the poster. And the proprietor of the shop said, well, the composer is here. Perhaps you'd like him to sign it. And uh, she said, oh, I'd love that. And Henry said, well, and the librettist is here. And uh, he signed it too. And I uh, said, uh, I believe the poster's uh, $10. If Henry signed it, of course, it's $20. And then if I sign it, it becomes $15. And Henry has never let me forget that story. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about Henry. How do you... Uh, Henry's a whole generation younger than I am, and we uh, came to meet and collaborate because he had gone to New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, 
And I had a friend there on the faculty, an old composer, musician by the name of Felix Wolfers, a whole generation of American opera singers uh, trained under Felix. And um, Henry was one of his students, and he had come to Felix probably in more or less his last year, or perhaps he even graduated, and said he had wanted to write an opera. He had a little commission from the Lake Placid Opera Company, but he wasn't sure about a libretto. And Felix knew that I was a sort of literary type and said, well, I have a friend who I think might enjoy writing a libretto for you. And Henry had picked the subject. I had no, tr he had picked a Hawthorne story, Young Goodman Brown. And this would have been in the early 70s, I'm going to say, give or take, uh, 73, 74. And uh, I did the libretto, the Hawthorne uh, uh, short story, and it got performed uh, one summer at Lake Placid, yes, Lake Placid Opera. And uh, it got a few performances thereafter. It never took off. And then uh, years passed, and we stayed in touch once in a while until he came to me, as I mentioned, the fall of 77. And Henry, of course, went on uh, I do, oh, I did one other opera with him when he got a commission from San Francisco Opera to do, uh, again, a short opera, and we picked this subject of Emperor Norton, this uh, legendary but historic character, eccentric character, uh, San Francisco gold rush days, and uh, we collaborated on that, and, uh, and then Henry would continue to write operas. Uh, thereafter, and I... Uh, understood this, he preferred to work with people who would be on the scene with him, that he could work directly with, even though we had no hard feelings. He just uh, wasn't comfortable with me being here in the East and uh, not being able to get together with him. But uh, he's written, as you know, a number of operas that have had considerable success. Starbird is perhaps one. Uh, Perhaps you know of some others. Well, the, the yeah. uh, Coyote Tales. Oh, yeah, Coyote right. Tales, right. Interesting, though, that this opera is the one that everybody knows. Yes, does. right. And, and I think it's yeah. a great tribute to you and to, and to Henry and a great tribute to um, mm -hmm. succinctness and shortness mm -hmm. that, that I think it's a great way to introduce people to opera. Yes, it's, um, it's proved to be that, right. Talk about the music and the, op and, and the lyrics together and the... And the What's attractive about this opera? Well, aside from the gimmicky plot, <laughs> uh, Henry is, you know, is a, uh, I guess the, the first word that comes to mind is an eclectic composer. And he, in this opera especially, he uh, seemed to just strike it right. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, uh, very contemporary, there's no question that it's a, a late 20th century work, but it uh, taps into, he's, you know, an Italian-American, he can't completely uh, avoid his Puccini uh, elements. Uh, he even brought in a phrase from uh, La Traviata, he, he works it in. Oh, I, I believe, I've just remembered my own libretto, the young woman in the modern opera who comes in, the modern phase, who walks in is a, a young opera singer at Central City. And she has just performed, and now she's coming to have a drink with her boyfriend. And so at one point she, she uh, sings a, a measure, a bar from La Traviata. And Henry uh, uh, works in all kinds of elements into his music, which, which I think is what makes it so appealing. The, it's lyrical. He can he uh, uh, he has melodies that you can actually leave the opera house singing if you have any knack for it. Uh, unlike so many modern operas, where there's nothing that, that most of us can walk out singing. Well, it's it's funny because this is my second you know this is my second uh -huh. film and I, my first film was with David Amram and I in my in my let me check the time oh, we're fine in my experience with working in. Um, Music and working, I, I, I record a lot of modern music, mm -hmm. a lot of Morton Feldman and John Cage. And yes, I finally came to the conclusion that it was all garbage, <laughs> and it was just it was it was it was as bad as anything you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm maybe the only person yeah. in my business who thinks that <laughs> way, but the certainly working with Amram, 
and, and be a conscious, the relief people feel when they're going to hear, yes. they're getting ready to hear a modern piece, and when they hear a melody, it's right. like a gigantic it's burden a, has been taken off of right. their, their shoulders. Right. Amram is another one I would call eclectic, oh, right? No doubt. No There's doubt. no question he's a 20th century composer. It's not that he's trying to uh, pass himself off as, as uh, anything other than that, but it's delightful music. What I know of his music. His main goal is to entertain, just yes. like Henry. Right. Everything else is subsidiary. That's he's right. not trying to impress his right. colleagues at the university. That's right. He's trying That's to make right. the average guy right. who right. pays the ticket and sits right. down That's right. have, an, have an enjoyable right. experience. Right. Give him some melody and some right. harmony and some rhythm, right. things that you can hang your right. head on. Yeah. I feel the same way about so much of modern sculpture and modern art. I'm glad on the one way I'm living in this world where all these modern painters and sculptors and musicians you mentioned are doing this, but I can't say they really speak to me. And I, I do wonder how many of them are going to be listened to and viewed and appreciated a hundred years from now. I mean, you just do wonder, right, without naming names, how many people are going to be listening to Milton Babbitt? <laughs> well, I always say, my, or, my joke is, you know, you know who, who, who comes home after a hard day's work right. and pours himself a martini <laughs> yes. and sits down and puts on an Elliot Carter piece of pizza. Yes. Not even Mrs. Carter. No. <laughs> and, and no. right. I, I, I agree right. with you. I think, I think we've gotten so far in all the right. arts. I have a right. friend who's an architect mm -hmm. who, who is also a jazz musician. He talks about you know, music and, and architecture mm -hmm. and, my, and, and, and fine art all went through the same thing of let's get rid of everything from the past and start right. anew. And, and right. you can't have art right. without knowing right. the past. Right. And so you have to build right. these in New York City right. that, you know, right. in the 50s and 60s right. that are just right. abominations. Right. Right. Because, you know, and then you have somebody like Philip, uh, uh, Philip Johnson who yes. did the, you know, the Chippendale building. Yes, you know, right. And everybody just loves to death because right. everyone yeah. has one in their bedroom. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Well, tell me. Tell me what you would tell a stranger about why they should go see. What would you tell a stranger who's never seen an opera before? Why why should they go and see a face on the bar before? Well, I think the first thing I would say is that they would just plain enjoy it. And I think I would say the reason they'd enjoy it is because it's uh, concise or uh, short and it's, it's straightforward, very dramatic. Uh, you know what you're seeing. You, you know what you're hearing. It's, it's, it's accessible. Maybe that's the word. It doesn't sound very uh, ambitious, does it? But I, I think it's because an accessible work. And, and uh, people just seem to enjoy it. it. It has an impact, too. I think because I'm just realizing because of the, if you will, the gimmicky ending and the, the shortness, it leaves people quite, uh, uh, not breathless, but it, it really, people, when it ends, I find uh, almost pull back. Uh, if, not, if not literally, metaphorically, they pull back at the ending. Uh, and there's something about that impact that they haven't had to sit for two hours. <laughs> it's been one other. You can even while you're like we're still recording. I, this is all. Oh, you know, really? Tape is tape is free. Um, practically. After I left Central City, I mean, uh, uh, I, I flew out from Denver and I had to fly to Chicago to change planes, and I took my seat as it happened on the aisle, and there was a man on the window and a woman in between us, and after we got in the air, I took out some of my materials that I had, you know, brochures and things. And I was just beginning to look over, read the cast notes and so forth. And the woman in the middle, uh, she turned to me and said, excuse me, sir, she said, I, I can't help but notice. Uh, have you come from the Central City Opera Festival? And I said, uh, yes, as a matter of fact. And she said, oh, well, I was there too. And she sort of said, were you associated with it in any way? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, yes, I... I, I did. I wrote the libretto to this. You wrote the libretto, and she she was all over this and everything, and she couldn't resist. She went there, and she turned to the man on the aisle and said, "This gentleman here writes opera librettos." And I'm thinking, well, finally, I'm coming into my own. 
And she he writes, and he looked unimpressed, and she said, and, and what do you do? And he said, I'm a watercolorist. And she said, and she now got more, what, oh really? And it turned out he was virtually world famous. His works are in museums all over the world. Irving Shapiro was his name, from Chicago. And, and immediately I was dropped once again. I thought for one minute, this little apprentice I had, and then this guy outclassed me. When was the, the last time you ran into a watercolorist? I looked him up as soon as I got home, and I'll be damned. He's in museums. All he's got websites. People pay tribute to him. He's, I think his name was Irving Shapiro. I think he since died. That's so funny. <laughs>